So the first phase of cellular respiration, whether it's aerobic or anaerobic, is glycolysis. And this is actually an anaerobic process. It requires no oxygen. Glycolysis literally means glucose breaks, and it occurs in the cytoplasm of all cells. Um, some cells don't have uh, anything but cytoplasm pretty much and we would be talking about prokaryotic cells like bacteria. Other cells have organelles and you'll see that um, in aerobic cellular respiration uh, everything except for glycolysis occurs at the mitochondria. Right, so this is just sort of an overview of what occurs and you should be taking a look at your sheet at this point. This is considered the energy investment phase because if you take a look at it you'll see that ATP actually is not being produced but is actually being put in at this point and as a result you're kind of going in the hole. It's sort of like starting a business having to actually invest in all of the things you need. If you open up a restaurant you have to buy the chairs and tables, put up a couple of months rent, hire the chef, hire the staff. You need money up front to begin. In this case you need energy up front to begin. And it's not unlike um, kind of just buying some seeds and planting them and having to wait for your reward or your payoff. Same idea. So this is the energy investment phase. At least the first part of glycolysis is the energy investment phase. We'll take a look at that. It all begins with a glucose molecule and the glucose molecule gets converted to something called gl glucose 6-phosphate. Uh, this occurs when an ATP molecule donates one of its phosphates to the glucose and it ends up being ADP. But the important thing is that the glucose molecule is now phosphorylated. It actually has a phosphate group attached to it. And this kind of destabilizes the glucose. It's kind of akin to um, a boxing match where someone gets hit in the head and they kind of stumble around on their feet for a little bit and they're just a little bit destabilized. This destabilizes the bonds of the glucose just ever so slightly, not enough to cause too much of a change. In the next phase, this glucose 6-phosphate actually gets converted to fructose 6-phosphate, just kind of rearranges the atoms a little bit, and that's pretty much it kind of reverts to fructose 6-phosphate because this is a little bit more stable than the glucose 6-phosphate. should note that every one of these reactions requires a different enzyme. And in the first phase, I've really just written in the name of one enzyme, which is hexokinase. We don't want to get hung up on the names of the enzymes, but we do want to know, we do want to remember that every one of these changes, um, every reaction that's taking place requires a different enzyme. Okay, so we're back to fructose 6-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate is just a more stable uh, version of glucose 6-phosphate. Um, it needs another hit of energy if anything's going to happen and that's exactly what happens. Another ATP molecule comes along and it donates another one of these high energy phosphates to the fructose. So now you can see that this is fructose 1,6-diphosphate and it's 1,6-diphosphate because it has two phosphates attached to it, attached really to its first and sixth carbons. We don't really have to worry about that. But now amazing things begin to happen because now there's enough energy held in the bonds of this sugar that bonds are going to start to break and there's going to be some major rearrangement. So what happens next is that fructose 1,6-diphosphate is broken down into two three carbon molecules. One of them is shown over here We've got an almost identical molecule over here um, that pretty much has three carbons. You can see them, one, two, three, and one phosphate. So it's kind of like half of this molecule gets split and goes this way, and the other half gets split and it goes this way. Really, we're just talking about the breaking apart of a molecule. And we end up with, with a little bit of rearranging, we end up with two molecules of glyceraldehyde phosphate. Now we get into the energy yielding phase. Um, those two three carbon molecules um, are going to have some things happen to them that's going to end up resulting in ATP not being invested anymore but actually being produced. 
And if you recall, during the in energy investment phase, we had two ATPs that we had to invest to get the process started to destabilize glucose and get it to break apart. And in this phase, we have four ATPs that are going to be produced. Um, so we're starting to get finally get a payoff and uh, it's kind of like the seeds that you planted are actually starting to grow into something that you can use. So let's take a look. Here's our glyceraldehyde phosphate. Okay. Carbon missing here. Okay, the three carbon molecules, each one of them has a phosphate. There's one, there's two, they're identical twins. Um, a lot happens in the next phase. Uh, free phosphate, which is represented as PI, that's just sort of floating around in the cytoplasm, gets incorporated into the molecule, and that happens um, in conjunction with uh, another uh, reaction that takes place where we get a molecule of NAD, which is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Um, actually picking up some hydrogen and electrons from the glyceraldehyde phosphate and with those electrons it picks up energy. This is kind of like a Houdini magic trick. Which hand is it in? Which cup is it under? Um, the energy is going from these molecules into this molecule. Okay, so the, that's where the energy is going. Some of the energy is still left in the remaining three carbon molecule and that energy also needs to be tapped out. You notice I said the energy goes into the NADH but the NADH is actually not ATP and it can't really be used by a cell in the same way so we'll see what happens to that a little bit later on. For now let's keep following this three carbon molecule because it still has quite a bit of energy remaining in it and we want to see where that all plays out. If you take a look at this image or the next step, you'll see that the three carbon molecule, and remember there's another one over here too, it's just not drawn in, that it's actually going to donate a phosphate group and its corresponding energy to an ADP molecule to produce ATP. Yay! We finally have some ATP that is a currency that the cell can actually use for energy. And here's another one being formed over here. We'll take a look at what happens in the next phase and we'll see that the phosphate is just kind of transferred to another carbon and it's sort of just rearranged. A few more rearrangements are made and some water is produced. But in step 10, we see that the remaining phosphate on the three carbon molecule, remember there's another one over here, it's just not drawn in, that remaining phosphate is actually removed from this molecule. And you can tell it's removed because the molecule that we're left with has no phosphate on it. Oh, where did the phosphate go? Once again, another ADP low energy molecule came along, snagged that phosphate, and now we have ATP, adenosine triphosphate. We actually have another one being formed as well over here. So we have two more ATP molecules being produced. And the final product of this is going to be pyruvate. Okay, so that's what this three carbon molecule is and again there'd be another one over here so we've got two pyruvate molecules being formed but really what's important here is that we have four ATPs that have been formed as a result of this process. Now depending on the organism and the oxygen conditions the two pyruvate molecules go through one of the following alcohol fermentation, lactic acid fer fermentation or aerobic respiration. Let's just summarize this and then we'll take a look at the possible fates of pyruvate. In glycolysis, we start with one glucose molecule and we put in two ATP. These are investments and this is the investment phase. The payoff is that we get two pyruvate molecules two NADH molecules which contain some energy and I haven't really told you anything about what's going to happen to that energy at this point. We get four ATP being produced all together and two ATP net. What that means is we have to start by putting in two ATPs like putting in money out of your pocket to get a business started. We got four ATPs back 
and that gives us a net gain of two ATPs. Okay, so this was our gross gain, but we had to invest that ATP to begin with. So we come out ahead by two ATPs. This is enough energy for simple organisms like uh, single celled organisms like bacteria and yeast cells. Definitely not enough energy for other organisms. So there has to be a way to tap out more energy out of these pyruvate molecules and that's what happens in aerobic cellular respiration and we'll take a look at that in the next video.